There is only power in the name of Jesus to break every chain and to set you free. And we're so glad you're joining us on Hope Today. I'm here with Anna and Tom, and we know it is Halloween, and we are giving the devil a black eye today. <laughs> Into that. Well, <laughs> let me ask you, have you ever had a problem you just couldn't seem to beat? A spiritual problem, maybe a sin you struggled with, or maybe you've noticed the same kind of problems seem to be popping up in your family tree from generation to generation. Well, our guest, Alexander Pagani, is going to be with us. He's going to share secrets to generational curses. What are they and how can we be free of them? And I think that's the key, guys. That's the key, Anna. Freedom for people today. Yeah, I don't know about you at home, but sometimes we are in these seasons where we just say like something has to break, like something needs to change in the family, something needs to change in the circumstances. And we know that our God is greater and that we can come to him. We can call on his authority. He has given us authority. We can come to him in boldness. And so today truly is going to be just a great conversation that we don't have to live in places where we are stuck, where we are constantly battling and feeling defeated. My spirit is so on fire because I'm just super excited for Alexander Pagani just to talk to us, to minister to us. And I just believe you better get ready. It is D-Day. It is Deliverance Day. It is time to break free from things. This is like one of my favorite topics ever. And I think it is so important that we have an understanding spiritually what is at the root so we can truly be set free. I am one that I have received deliverance. I am a recipient of it. I have experienced the power of the Holy Spirit. And I'm telling you, when you experience that and you see generational curses, maybe it's divorce, it's addiction, it's abuse, whatever it may be, witchcraft in your bloodline, there's certain things that God is highlighting it. So you may not even understand that you're being bound in your trap because Satan is a legalist and there's open doors in your family. So today we're just really excited and just know at any point you can give us a call at our prayer line at 888-665-4483 because we are here for you and it is our heart Tom to see everybody walking in victory and in power. And I'm always challenged by the verse that says our, our gospel is not a gospel of words but of power. Well Alexander Pagani is the founder of Amazing Church in the Bronx, New York. He's an apostolic Bible teacher with keen insight into the realm of the demonic generational curses and deliverance. And he joins us on Hope Today to bring the viewer understanding on how to break free from curses holding them back. You're gonna hear that today. Alexander, thank you so much for being with us. I feel sorry for the devil today. I authentically <laughs> feel sorry for the devil today. And for the viewers that are watching this, whether live or on a replay, why? Because today, Jesus, the curse breaker, is going to shatter every curse in your life and send the devil back to hell where he belongs, in Jesus' name. Oh, what a fantastic <laughs> promise for the program That's my intro, today. sir. That's my intro. <laughs> That's the way to do it, right there. Hey, let me ask you about your story, if we could, if we could just get to know you a little bit. How did you, uh, you know, come to this place and get involved in this type of uh, ministry and this type of deliverance and curse breaking ministry? I got saved in 1992 while serving a nine year prison sentence. I got sentenced to uh, nine years in prison. Um, and during my stay in prison, um, I had a supernatural encounter with Jesus Christ as a result of Christian correctional officers evangelizing to me. Um, so in the prison, I used to smoke Bible paper, and I'm not exaggerating. I would read the Bible while smoking marijuana with the other pages of the Bible. And funny enough, here's what's crazy is, is that everything that I read in the parables in the New Testament while being unsaved, I understood them. I understood the interpretations of the parables yet not being saved. And it was that that I began to wonder, okay, like maybe God is talking to me because I understand exactly what all of these parables mean. And when I got to the portions of scripture where Jesus would explain the parables, I, I started screaming because I realized, oh my Lord, I think God is talking to me. So it was there that um, one day, um, very late at night, Jesus came in my cell. That's the only way that I could explain it. He, he, I could see him in my peripheral view on, on my right side. And he spoke one word or one phrase. He said, follow me. And I remembered uh, my, you know, uh, my, grand, my Pentecostal grandmother that would tell me things, you know, about the presence of God when I was at an early age. So I started remembering all of those things she told me. And right there, I just became utterly aware of my sinfulness. He spoke to me and I felt immensely sinful, but 
I knew enough that I needed a savior. So I said this, the sinner's prayer in my own words. I, I said, Lord, uh, okay, I accept you. I accept you as my savior. I repent, you know. And he merged. He merged within my body, and I felt rivers of living water, but it felt like fire. Um, I found out later that that was the washing of regeneration. And from that moment uh, up until... I left prison, I served the Lord behind bars, and it was there in the prison that I started having dreams of me casting out demons. I didn't know that it was anything such as a ministry of deliverance, but in the prison I would have continual visions and dreams of me casting out demons. So what I felt was to get more into the Word, so I spent the rest of my prison sentence getting into the Scriptures, and when I was released, I started traveling the country, sharing my testimony. I met my wife, she's a pastor's daughter married her, became pastors, took over her dad's church, and it was there that I began to receive uh, members of our church that were immensely addicted to pornography and things like that. And I try my best to help them with all of my Bible training. And amen, Bible training is not wrong. I, I encourage everyone to get Bible training. But finally, one day I prayed. I said, Lord, w w what do I need to do? I'm trying my best. And he said, remember those dreams I gave you? Do that. Do the ministry of deliverance. And, and we did. And then here we are. Didn't know that I'd be one of the leading voices for deliverance globally. So in a nutshell, that's exactly how I got into it. But here's, here's what's crazy is, is that before I got to the point of helping our members get set free, I would preach against the ministry of deliverance because mm. Bible school told me a Christian couldn't have a demon. And we could kind of flesh that out as we talk. But I started off as prison, then preaching against deliverance, then embracing deliverance, and then here we are. I love how God does that. I love the story of uh, ripping the pages out of the Bible and, and uh, having, you know, yeah. rolling joints with part of that and, and reading the word. I'm glad you didn't rip out any, like, man, I hope you didn't rip out John 3 or something, you know, just, uh, <laughs> it's, it's just a great story. Well, let me ask you, let's, let's dive into this, the subject of, of generational curses, because uh, it, it is a, a topic that we need to uh, flesh out some things about. What are generational curses? Well, generational curses are warranted verdicts from the courtroom of heaven against the family, against the person, against the people group, against the nation that committed violations against God's law um, and the judgments that God has uh, verdict for, to be carried out against that person. So it doesn't start with God, but it's allowed by God. The courtroom of heaven has a penalty for every transgression uh, that we commit against it. So having an argument with my wife obviously won't produce a generational curse, but if I commit adultery on my wife, now we're talking about where I could potentially open the door to a generational curse. So it's the same earthly concept that we have, robbery in the first degree, robbery in the second degree, robbery in the third degree. Some sins don't warrant a curse, just like robbery in the third degree might not necessarily warrant 20 years in prison. But robbery in the first degree, which means a capital offense of the first degree, in heaven it's the same thing. So. A, uh, argument, anger with my wife or anger with a spouse might not produce a generational curse, but committing adultery on my spouse can. And we could kind of flesh that out. So that's, it's the same concept on earth as it is in heaven. So some sins don't warrant a curse, but other sins actually do, like witchcraft and idolatry. Well, today's Halloween. Practicing witchcraft will open a door to a generational curse. So when you're ministering to someone, how do you determine if this is this uh, behavior that they can just repent of? Is this something that needs deliverance? Or is there a generational curse in there that, that needs to be dealt with? How do you get to that place of understanding? Well, it's twofold. One, every deliverance minister, as every doctor, has to treat people coming for prayer like a doctor does. They, you believe them at what they're saying first, but then you also investigate. So if a person comes in, a, 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 you know, like, like, a, like a patient, a person for prayer, and they say, hey, I'm dealing with this X, Y, and Z. You don't tell them you're, you're a liar. That's not that. No, you listen and you hear them out. But then you ask your questions. So it's second, it's dependency on the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit, the discernment of spirits, where you also pry and ask questions, and then you help troubleshoot what could potentially be going on there. If there is a generational curse, well, then you lead them um, through the prayers of renouncing and everything to help them get set free from it. But everything is not a curse, but when it is a curse, you gotta deal with it and not say that it's a principle or it's a sin or it's the flesh. Right, so uh, let's, let's deal with one thing and we'll, we'll, we'll open up the discussion more here. 
Um, you, you spend some time in the book talking about Christians that have had some trouble with the whole idea of generational curses. And I have to say that I've been one of those questioning ones myself where I say, is this just a, uh, an influence? Is this a, is this a familial influence? Somebody grows up in an alcoholic household, so they become an alcoholic. How do we know that it's a generational curse versus just influence? Okay, very simple. Well, the first chapter of the book, I do dedicate it to debunking those who debunk yeah. generational curses. Because as I mentioned uh, earlier, I myself was against my theological upbringing and uh, biblical seminary training just couldn't open me up to the idea that a Christian can, can have a generational, a generational curse. But then I began to notice uh, habitual patterns of behavior with people who said, I'm doing everything right to not do that. Why am I still doing it? And I began to explore the idea that maybe there might be some demonic influence going on there. And when we get to explore that, well, obviously we wrote the first book, Secrets to Deliverance. We crash course right into the demonic. But then after the demonic gets resolved through a deliverance session and certain problems still persisted, I began to say, Lord, either we're teaching wrong or they're believing wrong. And the Holy Spirit said, there's a third element that you're missing, generational curse. You know, things being transferred down the bloodline and therefore started my journey of five years of really digging into the scriptures. And we actually found that there is a biblical premise for generational curses for the believer. So can you go deeper into that? Because I think this is something that is so crucial that people may not understand. Like I know even in my own family, it's like, okay, why are these things happening? But it's a very, very real thing. Right, okay, so the, to help answer that question, well, it's, it's a drawn out answer, but can a Christian have a generational curse? Well, number one, let's look at it logically, even though we want to use scripture, but I want to use something logically. Do Christians still attend funerals for other Christians? Obviously we do. We attend celebration of life services for believers that had gone on to be with the Lord. So let me ask this question. Why are Christians, spiritual Christians still dying? Why are they still dying? Well, if you say, well, that's the direct result of sin. Bingo, you just answered my question, who's sin? We are still feeling the effects of a generational curse of what Adam did thousands of years ago, though we're still believers. Now the question we have to ask is why? Because the efficacy of Christ's work on the cross broke the power of the curse, not the presence of curses. The cross of Jesus broke the power of sin, not the presence of sin. So as believers, if we begin to notice, because the Holy Spirit highlights habitual things uh, that keep happening frequently from one generation to the next, or even in our generation, or even we're carrying out patterns of behavior as a Christian from generations before us that we've never met. We've met children, I've met children two or three years old uh, that that you can see that they're acting like deceased family members that they've never met. And everyone will say, isn't little Joey acting like grandpa so-and-so? They never met grandpa. The, the, the information is being transferred from one generation to the next. And this is why I believe Jesus refers to himself as the root of Jesse. Notice he bypassed jo uh, Solomon. He bypassed David. He, by he went straight to Jesse. Why? Why did he go straight to Jesse? Because it's believed in biblical seminary. Not that it is and not that I'm preaching this, but it could be. The, the direct result that David, when David said, in sin, my mother conceived me. And when S Samuel came and said, give me all your sons, rightly so, you don't want to bring the son where it could have been the son of mess up, right? So let's just say that that, that that premise is authentically true. In Bible school, they believe that it is, right? That what you fail to address in one generation grows with the next generation. So let's say Jesse did have a problem in that area, and he fixed it, and he only messed up one time, but then tried to hide it. Well, it grew in his son, David. So D Jesse messed up once, David messed up a couple of times and lost. And by the time it got to Solomon, Solomon lost control in the area of lust. That's kind of like where you begin to see the pattern. Could what I'm doing, not all the time, and we don't want to take personal responsibility and over blame the devil. We're not preaching that as well. But what do you do when you realize, what if it is a generational curse? We can't explain it away saying, there's no such thing as generational curses, my brother. You know, Jesus became the curse for us. No, Jesus broke the power of the curse, 
not the presence of curses. So we begin to see habitual patterns of behavior that are unexplained, that are causing some sort of calamity over and over again. And I think we could be safe to say that Christians nowadays, spiritual, have a plethora of issues that we're dealing with as a, as a pastor. I think right now is the perfect time to, to actually believe in generational curses because we got believers committing suicide, pastors committing suicide, believers being addicted to drugs, believers fornicating, sleeping with the secretaries, all of that stuff. But there is hope in Jesus. Jesus is the curse breaker if we appropriately apply what he did on the cross for us. This is Amen. such powerful revelation. And one thing we do want to touch upon um, is because it is Halloween and this is a huge open door portal of a lot of things going on. And what's really heavy in our culture right now is witchcraft. Can you dive into that and how detrimental it is and how it's just wreaking havoc on us that we don't even fully recognize even as Christians? Well, gener uh, witchcraft will open a door to a generational curse. Mm -hmm. Out of all of the sins that God finds an abomination, witchcraft and idolatry are at the top two. So to help your believers understand why uh, days like today, and I'm not judging churches that celebrate it and switch it around and evangelize it or Christianize it. Hey, you, you, you know, you do you. But me as a Caribbean Afro-Latino coming from that, I want to do what Paul said, abstain from all appearance of evil. Even if I think God might not like it, I'm not doing it. But 1 John chapter 5 actually says it like this. If any brother sees a brother committing a sin that doesn't lead to death, you will pray and God will grant life. And if you see him committing a sin that does lead to death, then I will ask that you don't pray, which means God is not going to change his mind. The next verse says this. All unrighteousness is sin. Now, why do I have to throw this out? Because there are different degrees of sin. You got violation, you got sin, then you got transgression, then you have iniquity, and then you have an abomination. The first two are redeemable. The last three are not, which means there's certain sins. This is why God would overlook certain sins of people. And then others, he'd absolutely demolish them. Why? Because it's a courtroom thing. Listen to me, those of you that are watching. The issue with Halloween, it's not a personal preference. It's a legal issue. God hates it. So should you. Well, let me ask you, uh, 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 on that note, getting back to the whole idea of generational curses, and if someone's watching today and they say, I've struggled with something, that's how I, I started at the top of the show. You struggle with something, they've noticed something in their family, how do they get free? Because this is where we want to go with it, right? How do they get free from that thing? Number one is this kind doesn't come out but by prayer and fasting. Notice how in the story where Jesus made that statement, it was a bloodline issue. This is why Jesus asked the father before he helped the son. He said, he said, how long has this been happening to him? And what was the father's response from a child? This is setting up the premise that generational curses is actually there. Now watch this. Afterwards, the disciples asked, why couldn't we cast it out? Jesus authentically said, well, in that situation, it wasn't a demonized Christian issue. It was a bloodline issue. And this kind doesn't come out but by prayer and fasting. So the first way that you begin the process of resolving potential generational curses that a Christian might believe could be the root cause of, of their potential uh, uh, habitual sins that they're committing is get into a, season of, into a season of getting along with God, into a season of separating yourself and really pressing in and wanting to know, okay, Lord, Lord, is this really, what's really going on here? You know what frustrates me about I'm not going to say Christians because I'm a Christian here, is that we always want quick fixes. We want drive-by prayers. You know, we want to pull up to an altar call and just lay hands on me, and then I walk away with my little, you know, my little Happy Meal bag of I'm feeling good. 
No, we have to flesh out. How did you get to this point? What caused it? Why? Because if, if I give you the hamburger today, you'll be coming back on the line tomorrow. And I think Christians just want things so fast. What's fast is salvation. What's fast is your freedom. But the diagnosis might take some time. Why? Because your family bloodline can have generations of bad choices and patterns of behavior that need to be resolved. And you do this with separating yourself and saying, okay, God, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn the plate down. Begin to show me what's going on. Number two is this. When he shows you, own it. Own it. Don't quote a scripture back at God talking about what the Bible says. Like you're quoting God. You're quoting the word of God to God. No, you don't do that. You don't do Peter on the roof on the roof of Simon the Tanner's house where he said, no, God, I'm not going to let anything unclean. How are you telling God no? Like, Peter, Peter, man, you're crazy, man. Like, wow, you're telling God no, Peter? No, you don't tell God no, that doesn't exist. You say, okay, Lord, I, don't, I can see that. Okay, Lord, show me what to do. And then you go into, some, you go into a season of, a mo- or rather, moments of renouncing, mm-hmm. not repenting. <laughs> renouncing. I renounce that my family was involved in witchcraft. I renounce that I was participating that, in that ignorantly. And then there's other steps. My book kind of talks about that and your viewers would have to go, would have to like, I would encourage them to go pick it up and then get the rest of it. Because it's like six or seven steps that we have to go through. One more quick question for you, Alexander. So I think our human nature, we're in this like microwave culture where we expect something to happen so quickly, so immediately. When we're dealing with generational curses and we're praying and we're fasting, how quickly can we expect that these can break off of us and our family? It depends on the case. Some cases I've been there. I go to the courtroom, the judge looks at me and goes, case dismissed. Other times it kind of drags out. What I don't want our viewers to feel is is that, oh man, then how long is it gonna be? That's church talk again. That's church talk. It can be instantly. The issue is allowing the Holy Spirit to reveal what the root cause is and then allowing Jesus to break it. What I'm trying to help your viewers not do is just take it as, just come up and then walk away and then not realize the ramifications of what got you to that point and not pay attention because we just want the, just give me the blessing, give me the fish and the loaves and then we walk away and don't realize what actually got you to the point of starvation. That's what we're trying to say. But what I'm not trying to say is, is that, that it's gonna be this long dragged out court case. No, that's again, Christians misinterpreting stuff. What I am saying is this, is, is that when you get to that point, the Holy Spirit will make you get completely set free. But at the same time, he's gonna reveal to you how you got there. I just want our viewers to spend time in the presence of the Holy Spirit and not just looking for a you know quick emergency room drive-by thing. And then watch this, they get the freedom, but they don't know what got them there, then they go and do it again. And then they come back to deliverance, and then there's, a, then there's deliverance idolatry and deliverance addiction, which is a whole nother topic there. The goal of my book is to break deliverance idolatry, demon conscience, overblaming the devil, and really getting an answer, breaking it. I broke the generational curse of destruction on my life. It took me a little bit to get there because I couldn't believe a Christian can have a generational curse. But when I realized that I had it as a pastor, people would join my church and then leave my church then join my church, leave my church. We were like always growing and emptying out. When finally I was like, God, what's going on? I love the Lord. I love you. He said, but you got a generational curse of destruction. Anything that comes in your hands, you don't keep it for long. When I dealt with it, now we became the fastest growing church in the Bronx and still are since that day until now. We retain everyone that comes to our church. Fantastic, fantastic. I I need to ask you, and I want to ask you to pray for uh, the viewers. Pray for the people that are watching right now, if you would, and just just so that they can lock into what God wants to do in their life. Heavenly Father, I pray that every person under the sound of my voice, Lord, that in the midst of church jargon, and church narratives that they've been taught in their mind. Father, invade that and speak to them beyond all of those theological and religious barriers that are there of how they believe this uh, ministry of deliverance 
uh, is supposed to be appropriated. And Father, find them. And I pray that as you find them in the midst of all of that, Lord, you would bring revelation to them, Holy Spirit. Guide them into all truth. And then inspire them to make the necessary uh, decisions, Lord, for their freedom. I come against spirit of confusion, religious spirit, spirit of causing them to be lost in church and ease language, wandering in misunderstanding. I bind your works now in the name of Jesus. And Father, I speak clarity to their minds, Lord, in the name of Jesus. And Father, I pray for every person that's bound now. I command every unclean spirit to loose their mind. Release them now in Jesus' name. Holy Spirit, I humbly ask, Lord, that you would invade them, Lord, in a loving way. Increase your presence in their life and cause them to come to the acknowledgement of the truth that they may escape the devil's snare according to 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 23, Father. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. 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 Alexander Pagani, the book is called The Secrets to Generational Curses, Break the Stronghold in the Bloodline. It was wonderful having you. God bless you. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you for having me on. Awesome. That's, that's, uh, that's pretty powerful stuff. <laughs> yeah, that was fantastic. I have not received a lot of teaching on generational curses, but I certainly sense and feel that it is in the family. And so it's good to be empowered with that knowledge so that we can get to work praying and fasting. Absolutely. It is powerful. Deliverance is powerful. And I just want to encourage you, maybe just like you're like Ann and you're like, you know what? I haven't really heard a lot on generational curses and things of the demonic realm in my family. Can I tell you? It is necessary for you to do the deep work, spending time with the Holy Spirit, because guess what? The generations and your legacy is counting on it. You may be the one as the chain breaker to be set free. You know, maybe there's certain places where your family came from. We heard Alexander said he's Afro Latino from the Caribbean. I'm from the Caribbean. There's certain things that even as Americans, we come from different places that we have carried with us and we may not understand that we are bound. So we just wanna encourage you today, spend time with the Holy Spirit and listen to to God because I truly believe that he wants to set you free. He wants you to go through the process of deliverance. It's not pretty. It can be very painful. It can be very ugly, but I'm telling you, there is such hope when you get to the other side. There's such freedom when you get to the other side. And I'm telling you, when you do that and you do the deep work, you give the devil the biggest black eye and it is fantastic because that's the freedom. That's the hope we have in Jesus day. We love you. Have a great day.